Hello, and welcome to our first episode of 2022. Just before we get into this, I want to share some news. Uh, yesterday we had a paper published in PLOS Biology, and it's been under embargo for a few months now, so it's great to finally be able to talk about it. And I apologise for what is about to be a self-plug, but hand on heart, I just want to promote the co-authors here. This is very much their win, and I was just lucky enough to be along for the ride. So this is one of the best teams I've ever worked with, and if you, you find them on Twitter, tell them they're amazing. What we did here was we investigated the quality of all of the COVID preprints that were published within the first four months of the pandemic by comparing the preprint with the published version. This is quite a lot of work. It meant manually annotating and comparing 210 pairs, which was a huge undertaking. Ultimately, what we found was that both COVID and non-COVID preprints were broadly unchanged when they were published. Although if you want to know just how unchanged they were, you are going to have to go and read the paper. If you want to read the paper, there'll be a link in the show notes below. And coincidentally, we'll also be coming to you on German radio today, uh, as well as a few journalistic pieces that are covering our paper in the coming days. Once again, huge congratulations to the team involved, and please do tell them they're amazing on Twitter. But for now, John, roll the intro. Hello, and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. Today we discuss a really cool CRISPR tool and magnetic gen- magnetogenetics with postdoc and genius Jakub Gemperli. So thank you so much for, for agreeing to come on. It's a really, really cool paper. I'll be honest, I didn't understand a lot of it, but it was a really cool paper. I think it's more Emma's actually than mine, really. Yeah, I did enjoy I used the Tetron system as well. <laughs> so. so there you go. So Emma, Emma might jump in with questions. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm kind of excited to talk to you because your interests align quite nicely with mine. Um, you you say you do quite a lot of uh, adrenaline fueled activities outside of the lab. So you've been white water rafting, which I've never done and I would love to do. I think I'd die doing it, but I'd love to do it. Um, but you've also been uh, to Via Ferrata's and things, which I've actually got one, pl- well, hopefully got one planned this year for, for Italy. So like, how do you find balancing that adventure side with science and, and you know the amount of energy it takes to do science? Uh, if I think if I want to be like properly relaxed, I need to do something like uh, more crazy for adrenaline. So if I'm like physically totally like completely like you know uh, out of energy, it's like complete drought, then I feel totally relaxed. So this kind of adventure, uh, kind of like uh, water rafting, you know, adventure, it's as I said, yeah, it's completely change your thinking. You, you can't think about science doing <laughs> do, 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 doing rafting, you know, so. That's why I love it, basically. Yeah, I get the same kind of thing, actually, yeah. Um, and you also travel a lot, and your top three places were all really cool places that I'm I'm basically just highly jealous. So so what were your top three places? Where, where have you particularly loved going? Uh, I love Yellowstone National Park in USA. It's an amazing park, and there are so many animals there. You can see it, see, see them, you know, just from, even from a car, or you can, like, hike, and then explore uh, then I think uh, Serengeti National Park in Africa it's also like amazing place full of animals you can basically see lions by by yourself giraffes elephants and then uh, I would say the Galapagos Islands uh, which is again you can like uh, dark snorkel alongside and see almost touch uh, sharks turtles and also then you can actually uh, get back to uh, Ecuador, which is basically, basically Galap- Galapagos are islands of Ecuador. And there you can go to Amazonia, you know, again, see some other animals. Then you can climb some very really high mountains like Cotopaxi. It's like a volcano, actually. And it's amazing to see from the top, actually, to see the smoke coming from the volcano. Yeah, so these are my top three places. And if I can add one more, it would be uh, Iceland. Oh, I, I'm, I, I, I really want to do a hiking trip across Iceland this year as well. Oh, I was going to go for my birthday, so my birthday is in February, and I really want to go to Iceland. And, like, we've, we haven't, we haven't because of various COVID-related things, but I would love to go and... It looks amazing. <laughs> it is. Actually, the, even the, the driving itself, it's just amazing experience. If you are driving through the inland, you are basically going over the rivers, you know, because there are no bridges. So it's always, always oh. also a big adventure because you never know if you actually are able to go over that river. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Yeah. Well, I'm I'm very jealous. And then, of course, you've done a really cool preprint, so I'm just even more jealous. Um, so uh, let's let's get into the science then. So so basically, what you've done is you you've created a system that kind of essentially allows you to reactivate transcription or silence genes on command, and you've broken that down into three different systems. So I think a, a sensible starting place, because a lot of acronyms in here, would be to go through each one, and if you could just give us a brief description of what each one is. So let's start with uh, Dexcon. <laughs> okay, let's let me explain what's that. So we develop the tools for precise control of endogenous gene expression. This Dexcon, it means basically doxycycline mediated control of endogenous genes. And uh, basically, by harnessing the power of uh, tetracycline inducible system with uh, CRISPR-based knockins, we can now, as you said, inactivate genes. And this, this, this one is the simplest one. Uh, so, as I said, we need to deliver to cells uh, the transcription factor, which will bind the inducible promoter. And by delivering the promoter to the gene where we want, you can actually block the gene from being actively uh, translated because in this promoter actually are basically initiation codons which will drive the transcription, but only when you want. The, 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 the second one, the Luxon, is basically the same as Dexcon. It's just we are using a published version of a light inducible teton system. So now actually you can just illuminate cells by blue light and now you can activate whatever you want, where you want. And because you are using light, you can do it like a spatial temporally anywhere you want, basically. And the third system, which is my favorite now, it's uh, called Dexogron. And it's basically a combination of Dexcon with the uh, Degron technology, if you ever heard about it. Uh, it's basically, Degron technology is that you can induce degradation of proteins inside the proteasome. So you are basically controlling not genes, but proteins by, for example, adding auxin. So it's a hormone, and I was trying to combine uh, like Dexcon with the Degron, so we call it Dexogron. So now basically we can like have a dual input, so we can add doxycycline and auxin together. Uh, if you do it together, you can basically balance uh, the expression level you want. Then you can remove doxycycline, just keep auxin, and you will get a dramatic drop of the protein levels very, very, very quickly. Or you can just add doxycycline and, you know, and just it's going on and keep it uh, high for microscopy, for example. Because I didn't uh, mention one thing, but we are also adding to the genome uh, genes for the fluorophore, for, for the fluorescence. So it means we can actually, actually image the rescues directly because there is the fluorophore. Uh, that's basically it. <laughs> and now you've added another one of my favorite things in there, microscopy. You're ticking all my boxes. So, I mean, this sounds like a really cool system where, you know, you can get a really good idea for the, the difference between the role of a, a gene versus the protein, which is, I mean, it's one of the things I've come across a lot more recently in my research is that there's a big discrepancy between what people are looking at with genes and what people find when they look at the protein level expression. So presumably Dexcon and Dexagron would be incredibly powerful together in, in that same system. Definitely. We are, I completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So could you go back a little bit and just explain how you came about designing this construct? Why, why is it you wanted to come up with this system? I have to say this is basically a site project. <laughs> because um, I got Marie Curie Fellowship and I was proposing to do something with CRISPR and with magnets. So basically I wanted to control cells by using magnets. And because in our lab we are, <laughs> we are studying uh, rapid and GT bases. And the one, my favorite one, is called rapid 5 which is very often like um, not present in, in cells, but once reactivated, it's uh, correlated with uh, aggressiveness of breast and ovarian cancer uh, and with various prognosis of, of patients. But my problem was that in the cells I wanted to be using, uh, this gene is not active. And then, you know, I wanted to use CRISPR, but then the gene was not active. And if you knock in a fluorophore or something to the genome, if the gene is not active, you will not see it. So, yeah. And then I have this like a uh, simple clever idea, clever idea that why I can just reactivate it, you know, combining the CRISPR with the power of the tetracycline inducible system. And I, I just simply tried that. I didn't expect it will work. And then second day, basically, I was like, wow, well, it's working. You know, I can see it. And also I could see like, uh, like plenty of cells, you know, giving me the right signal as I would expect, you know. So that was really great because I didn't, I didn't mention it, but basically I was trying to, all the, for all the cost, be not working with clones because, you know, clones, they are so heterogenic. So if you can like avoid working with clones, it's great. And basically our uh, approach uh, can be done without uh, selecting cells as clones. So you can have it as polyclonal and all you get should be after you sort cells by cell sort because you're having that fluorescence 
as a readout, it should be all correct. So that, I mean, that that's your sort of basic system. So why did you then be even cleverer and build on that to do to do all these extra things you've done in there? Why, why did you choose to add that level of complexity? Was that out of like an experimental need, or were you just showing off? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so basically, uh, I wanted to have a separate paper as a method, as a paper for, as showing like method, you know, new kind of method. Yeah, and my PI was uh, keep saying like it's not enough, it's not enough. So I was <laughs> adding more level of complexity. And then I had like one student, uh, very clever. He was like helping me a lot, and he was like driving me forward, you know, because he wanted to help me a lot, and he was helping me a lot. So I was like keep asking him, can you do this for me, you know? And he was doing it, you know. So, and then we got this amount of work, which was great for big paper. And why did you choose to add the light responsive element in there? Again, was that a specific need or was that because you were already working with a microscope and so just kind of, it made innate sense to, to add that element in? Because it was possible. And because I found a system which was like really nice complementer system to mine, which I could use and make it forward with something else extra. And then I have like idea because RAP25 is a, um, a, a GT pace, which basically bind vesicles, which will uh, recycle vesicles towards uh, sliding edge and increasing invasion. So then actually, why not to bring it forward and just try to do some correlation with cell invasion and with the exploration level, which we can control by light. And we can do it like a spatial temporal. You can just activate some cells, you know, in, in the uh, extracellular matrix. Or we can just, uh, just by, by timing of a flight, we can just, you know, make this nice correlation and this increase the confidence, you know, of your results, right? So with the, the, the light method, is that something you can use? I mean, it, it sounds like it'd be really good for organoids and tissues, but it's, so I work a lot with uh, 3D tissues. And is that something where you can target maybe like a middle layer in the tissue with the light and mm. focus the, the wavelength like that? Yeah, I, I don't try, but as you say, it's, it's limited by sample thickness. So definitely, you, you, I don't think you can target the, the whole organite, just the top layer, maybe, as you said, top middle layer. Yeah, and that's actually why I am now trying to work with magnets, because they are not limited by uh, sample thickness. And you can even, I, I, I just read the paper about, you can even like control uh, like mice by magnets. Yeah, in the paper they say, basically that uh, you can uh, fuse uh, one receptor in neurons, you know, to ferritin. And in theory, ferritin binds, binds you know, uh, like uh, iron, uh, iron molecules. So in theory, even if it's so weak, in theory, you can somehow influence by nanoparticles these uh, receptors. And based on the paper, we're able to basically modulate the behavior of mice, you know, in labyrinth, the way that they were more staying in the area of labyrinth where there was magnetic field. And it somehow stimulated the pleasure center in their brains. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. We can all get little magnets put in our heads. <laughs> <laughs> so, is this light based system? Uh, can you tune that the way you can with the drug based system? Definitely, you can. You can uh, basically the the, the, the Luxon version of Dexcon is has the same benefits as Dexcon, but you can do it by light, and the cycling can be you can have like that on system or that off. So it means uh, you have to add both doxycycline and light or just light and you can block it by doxycycline. So it's just how you want, you know. And do you see any um, toxicity with any of these systems? Because, I mean, doxycycline can be toxic. Yeah, but we are using such low level because we are using the third generation of the tetracycline as well system and we are using basically like uh, almost nothing, like less than 100 nanograms per mil. It's basically like, like, like it's really low. And with the light, I actually, I bought... I bought Blue Torch from Amazon to doing that. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's really weak light. Uh, I can even like use it directly to my eyes and it'll be fine. <laughs> okay, that's pretty, that's really cool then. So that, that, that's a really good system. <laughs> but, but I actually noticed, I should notice that basically I just used uh, technology already here and just, I just combined it, it in a new way. And to be honest, I'm quite surprised that nobody else before me just did, did it because it's so simple to do it. <laughs> it takes the genius to, to put it together though. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you made this as a, a split binary domain between the uh, looks and docs. Um, do you have a preference as to which one you use? In the future, I would be using Dexagon just because uh, it has all the benefits of, of Dexcon, but there is this one extra layer of, you know, of control. And I, I, I love on that that basically with this system, what you can do, you can even study like immediate effect of uh, gene Knockouts, let's say, because it can be done like uh, in less than 
one day, a couple of hours. And you can basically even like, uh, uh, let's say, keep adding docs just to be sure that the cell will not be adapted to the loss of the gene. And then you can just uh, just add the auxin, remove the docs, and just you have it instantly. And that's, I think, really powerful because, yeah, if you just do knockout, then uh, very often cells will adapt to that. And for essential genes, if you have essential genes, basically the cell will die, right? But by doing this, you can have the both benefits. And actually, you can even like, uh, the main benefit in it, you have not only KO, like knockout and rescue in one package, but because of the fluorophore, you have also like uh, the imaging, you know, like it's a benefit. And because you can actually tune the levels up and down as you want, you can actually, let's say, for some systems, you need more more expression. It's, it's not enough to see it, you know. So you can just simply increase it up. And for something, you just want to have it really physiological. So you can go to do right levels just to be sure and that's really cool i think yeah i mean my my mind is just racing with with ideas of things i now want to do with this system um yeah i'm half tempted to be like um that would be i'm gonna present maybe this in my next journal club for my lab because we do lots of CRISPR and teton based things and um it's a really really cool tool <laughs> i think this is really benefited because this teton system is already like here so it means it will just you can just slightly modify it in a new way, and it's working even much better than before, right? So you can be sure it will work. And if you just add this little level of what we did with CRISPR, then it's a new area of uh, I hope it will be like a new area of research because this is opening new new avenues. And I try to demonstrate it by studying rapid and GTPases, which is an excellent lead into my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so, like you said, you've used this to study the Rab proteins. So, could you just give us a little bit of background what Rab proteins are and what exactly it was you've used this system for? So, we are studying uh, Rab uh, GTPases, uh, Rab11 family, basically, which are well known that they are recycling vesicles from cell body to the cell front, and is somehow allowing cells to uh, effectively migrate, for example, invade if it's cancer cell because these vesicles are recycling uh, receptors for binding to extracellular matrix. So if, if you basically modify the genes to see it, you should be able to see like vesicles going and recycling all the time and going to different parts of the cells. And uh, yeah, and these three members of an A, B, and 25, uh, they are well known that uh, they somehow can uh, have a relevance uh, on, on breast and bone cancer. So very fun, at least ROP25 is well known, as I said before, that if it's basically reactivated from genome because it's not ubiquitous, especially this one, uh, it leads to something really bad. Uh, and I, I decided to use to study these three uh, genes because in our lab, in Patrick Asphalt lab, where, where I am, we are studying them. And also, it's kind of they are quite similar. And especially if you want to try to study similar, you know, genes, it's very often hard to, to study it by using antibodies. That's one thing. Yeah, and that's it. I think. <laughs> But this, so this is not what your fellowship is on, correct? Uh, it's not, uh, it's partially, it's partially not. As I said, uh, I, I propose to use magnets to control cells, to control vesicles, basically to control our 25 vesicles. And uh, yeah, in the beginning, because in order to do it, uh, I need to modify uh, the gene the way uh, I can then uh, allow binding of nanoparticles which are magnetic, which I can control by magnets. So when you do it, I need to modify the gene. But as I said, the RAP25 was not present in the cells I was trying to study. And also I find one really big pitfall I was not aware of before because I was following like a, like the top uh, newest preprints at the time to be, in order to be uh, on the top of the uh, of the novelty of the research, you know, just to keep going. And uh, I was not aware that uh, if you try to do knock-in, like to, to integrate a gene to in, in front of uh, one gene, uh, very often it's got truncated. So it means you get like non-complete integrations. And even though if you do it in the best way possible, because there are multiple options how you can do it. If you do it the best way possible, very often you get truncation in the knocking. So it's not fully integrated. And I found that basically dur dur during like first year I was doing it. And then my Dexcon actually saved it as well, because if you use uh, basically the Dexcon module to the promoter there, basically then you can uh, basically knock in also a gene which is not fluorescent, because normally we are using only for like for knocking of genes for fluorescence. And then by uh, fluorescence, by sorting, you can sort the, the, the one which did it the right way. So you don't have to have clones. And if you use this con module, you can actually sort something else as well, which is not fluorescent and be full length, which is great. So right now I, I am able to do it. 
And now I have uh, basically let's say another body against GFP. So I have another body knocked in in front of a uh, 5 gene. And then I have nanoparticles which are functionalized by GFP. So I can see them. They are green inside the cell. And now if I uh, basically add nanoparticles to cells, they are green because they are, you know, having GFP. And then my vesicles are having also M cherry there. So I can see them. They are red. They will bind in a couple of seconds together. So now I have all the vesicles inside the cell, red and green. And now I'm trying to move using, let's say, a magnetic tip uh, connected to micro manipulator. And I'm moving with the, with the tip. And then the vesicles are following my movement, which is, I think, quite cool. And then I'm trying actually to see what will happen with the cell protrusions. Will the cell move my way or not? And yeah, it's quite big fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I you described it as um, controlling cancer cells like puppets. And I just, I could not imagine some crazy evil scientists just hovering over the, the cell culture dishes. Um, so, I mean, when you're doing this... I, Presumably, there is a limit as to how much of these particles you can get inside of a cell before you just start moving the cell, right? Because yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. have it too magnetic, I guess. Uh, I think the, the biggest problem is you cannot like fuck the cells. So you need to basically be, be sure that the cell is still quite healthy. And if you put just too, too much of it, just too much volume, uh, the cell will die or will not follow you. So the, the, the cytoskeleton has to be intact. So that's actually at the beginning was quite a big problem because I was trying to do it here in Manchester and I was actually uh, going for two weeks to Germany. Uh, they actually they were helping me to 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 be able to start with mag magnets with magnetogenetics because it's very quite hard to start from your own and I think you can't do it by your own. You have to have help. So I got great help from Germany. Thank you, Germany. <laughs> uh, and then I got back to Manchester and basically yeah there was nice microscopes but there was the system was not built so i had to help to peter march which basically he's a great guy he could he can even build the microscope from from scratch and he helped me to find micro manipulator which was like uh, full of dust in the corner you know not used for 10 years then he helped me to localize uh, the, the the pump for micro injection also in other lab like 10 years not used you know full of dust and then he helped me to assemble this uh, around the spinning disc he even helped me to to build a, a chamber uh, from a cardboard, so I have now a cardboard around the microscope uh, to give it a seven degree, and then yes, then I started doing it <laughs> to have fun. Yeah. So how how did you come across this field to begin with? Because I mean, it wasn't my experience with anything magnetic and cells is just those kits you get when you're isolating cells out from a sample. That's about as far as I get with that, and they're just antibodies that have a bit of metal bound to them, really. So how did you how did you actually fall into this? Yeah. So I'm. I will always like to um, have a fun with artificial systems. And I was always trying to do more stuff with CRISPR. And then, as I said, I basically, uh, four years ago, I met Pat, my, my current uh, boss, PI, on the conference in Paris. And basically, he was great. Uh, we had a nice time, you know, drinking wine, you know. And then I had like feeling it would be great to be in his lab. And then, basically, we tried to find a funding for, for me in advance. And basically, uh, in order to get Marakiri Fellowship, which I got at the end, you need to come with something really crazy, something like uh, groundbreaking, a lot of novel. You, ha you also somehow need to be able to demonstrate it's possible. You are the best guy to do it. And the lab you are going is the best lab you should be going. Yeah, and somehow I was like reading literature, trying to find cool stuff. And then I, I approached Magnets. And then, then, then I knew uh, this, is, this is it. I want to do it because it's so amazing. I can be a big fan. And actually, because of my publications before, uh, I basically had something which was like something uh, I could be using for the preparation of, of the nanoparticles. And also... I, was, I wanted to apply it in a new context, cancer relevant context. So it was basically a past lab, the, the best lab I could be doing it. We somehow persuaded uh, the committee it's possible to do it. How do you find Manchester? Because we, we were, the team here is all from uh, Sheffield, where we did our PhDs. And I, I mean, Sheffield's great, but Manchester's a great city. And the university there is really nice. I once went over to have help with a new technique as well, and it was lovely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely, but it's raining a lot, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, you get all the rain. Sheffield gets none of it. It's great. Actually, Sheffield is great. I've also been in, uh, I've been in Sheffield uh, three times. Uh, water skiing. Have you been doing water skiing? No. Yeah. Where did you do that in Sheffield? There's water skiing in Sheffield? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? Yes. And it, I have been already three to four times. There's like a big uh, pond. And it's there. And it's like lovely. It's like a circle lift going around on that lake. And I will just, you know, like uh, catch the lift. And then you are going around on, on skis or on wakeboard. Well, we so. missed out on this. <laughs> well, we can always go back, Johnny. We know enough people. <laughs> so 
it just so happens that this week I've been well for the past two weeks I've been doing this this thing online with uh, school kids where they basically just ask a scientist questions. It's supposed to be pandemic related, but to be honest, they've been asking anything from pandemic questions to what's your favorite ice cream flavor. And one of the questions you asked us in the little form we get our guests to fill out is one of the questions that has kind of come up a bit. So I thought it might be interesting to discuss. So a lot of this work is very much down the route of modifying genes. Eventually, it, the aim would be to do this in animals. So you asked us what we think about sort of gene modifications <laughs> and, and the ethics associated with that, uh, which I've answered a lot the past two weeks. But how, how do you feel about that? Because yeah. it is a there's strong arguments on both sides with that kind of thing. And I mean, do you have any sort of hard lines where you think it would go too far? It could go too far? Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, my feeling, because I'm really crazy, my feeling is that <laughs> that ethics in this kind of uh, research is really slowing down the progress. And very often, if you don't try, you don't know, right? Mm. And I understand why, why people are afraid. Or it is it's very important to be here. It has to be here. But my feeling is, for example, like uh, like studying like uh, human embryos. You can't you can't do it longer than two weeks after it's implanted to the womb. So basically, you can't know what will happen after. But if you don't study it, if you even don't allow it, you never know. And for example, if I can I follow on this, I, I I tell it to my friends all the time. It would be so great because right now there is technology and it's already like five years old to be able to produce human organs in pigs, mm. which would be your own organs grown in pigs and. Technology is here. We just uh, are not doing it because of ethics. And yeah, and I think uh, in news now it was that uh, in USA they uh, I, th I think use uh, pig uh, pig heart to, to yes. for for human. And wouldn't it be much better to use a human heart grown in pigs delivered to humans. Yeah. So this this was the the, uh, the first time they've ever transplanted a human pig into a human uh, a human yeah. pig. A thick heart <laughs> into a human. Oh, it's been such a long day. <laughs> I've been at work since six o'clock this morning. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was it was fascinating. And actually, the, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned the the pig stuff because that has. I think it was like ten years ago. It was one of those things where they go, "Where's science going to be in ten years?" And that I think was actually on the list. We were going to start, mm. you know, growing human organs in pigs. And it is it is kind of strange that it hasn't happened yet i mean do you think it will happen yeah. is this something you think the ethics will change on i, I hope i think the now problem why they don't want to progress is actually is that because you, you can inactivate inactivate uh, any gene you want in a pig embryo and then you can add your human cells for example even like you can take your skin cells really differentiate it to, to pluripotent stem cells put it back you know to, 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 to the embryo and then from the embryo only your cells will, will rise to the organ you want so it means for example if you need your heart you can activate the gene for heart development in the embryo of pig. You can inject your your stem cell to the embryo, and you will get your your own heart. The problem is why ethics, you know, is still here, preventing any progress, is because your cells can theory also give rise to something else. For example, partially of the pig's brain, for example, or different organs. And then you don't know if the pig at the end who will be still pig or is it partial human? Can it actually speak or can it think as a human? And that's a big problem. But that, that, that's a problem, right? One, if you don't try it, you don't know, right? But to me, I think we are so different pigs from humans that I would be so surprised if this would be possible. I can imagine like a couple of cells, you know, going to the brain, but I don't think they will change anything. So I was, again, just weirdly, uh, watching a documentary about uh, Dolly the sheep recently. I think it's on Netflix. If anyone has seen it, it's really good. It might be on iPlayer. Anyway, there's a Dolly the Sheep documentary out there. It's quite interesting. Um, and yeah, it, it was kind of focused on the, the the media reaction to the particular science that was involved in that. And it was really interesting to see just how the general public respond to that, but also how quickly everyone just stops caring again. And it, it was amazing because it was like top news for quite a little while and then just suddenly nothing and nobody cared anymore. And then nobody cared again until Dolly died. So it is, it's in, it, public opinion sways surprisingly quickly yeah and that has surprisingly been a very smooth segue into the preprinting part of the chat so you've already said sort of some of the benefits you've had from preprints so that you know you read them to be on the cutting edge of what's going on but why whose decision was it to preprint this work was that you or was it the pi uh, uh both me and my pi we are publishing as preprints uh, papers first but for me this decision came already like before i was in his lab and actually, the reason I got Maracaibo Fellowship 
I have to stress it. The reason I got it is because I could publish preprints. And because if I would not have it as out as a preprint, I would not get it. So this really helped me and it really counts. If you have preprint prep out, it really counts because it's proof you have the whole story out. And usually if you can just open it and read it, you can say it's really good paper or bad, just based on you see it. And to be honest, actually, I think it's, if you, if you, have, if you have a paper like in Nature or preprint like in Post One, the one in Post One game is still better. So actually mm. people should still, you know, be looking at it directly and not just be judging your, your paper based on the journal. Right. Yeah, we, we I had this argument with a friend and we had him on the podcast not long ago. Um, he likes to read journals, whereas I try and make the point that actually you should be reading the paper, not the journal. But huh. I think we, we agreed on some <laughs> nice middle ground somewhere to keep the peace. Um, so, I mean, that, have you got any other benefits from preprinting? Because, I mean, it's it's a really cool. I, I picked this up quite a bit on Twitter, so it's it's gotten some attention at least. I have to say, yeah, that I could also, you know, my, as my now I have my preprint, so... The benefit is people can flow much sooner, much faster. Mm. They can also like, uh, you know, if, if they find out that I did something horribly wrong, they can just tell me <laughs> and I will know sooner uh, before I will, you know, uh, make it forward with this. And uh, yeah, and also thanks to that, I could actually tweet it on Twitter. And also Twitter, I was so surprised how powerful it is. Mm. So thanks to that, I think you also f- found it, right? Yeah. Yeah. We find most of the papers for this through Twitter, actually. Hmm. It's a good. It's a good way of figuring out what a, a good preprint's actually, because the good ones tend to get quite a lot of attention. Yeah, but sometimes even like you know, even bad papers can get a lot of attention. They can. Negative one, and still it will get you know promoted. Yeah. By robots. Which brings us into the current system of peer review, uh, which is something else you mentioned <laughs> to us is that you highlight the particular point was that you know you can submit to a journal and then it goes off review. The journal decides they don't want it, so you submit to another journal. It goes off review again, and you, know, you can get yeah. the same comments back, and it, it just bounces around, and it's yeah. a huge waste in time and money and effort. So, when I mean, have you have you ever thought about using something like Review Commons or one of the other preprint review servers? Uh, actually, I'm not so sure if I heard about it. So you can you can. So there's Re- Review Review Commons is kind of the, the I guess the most well known one, but there's a few now where basically they will review your preprint. The idea being that you can then submit the reviews with your preprint to the journal wow. uh, if the journal's taking part. And then that, the idea being that, of course, it means you don't have to go through these constant rounds of revisions. Ah, I see. Yeah, definitely. I would, uh, I would, I would be using that. I just remember we were trying to publish or send this paper, this preprint to uh, Nature Methods, and they had the option that you can actually get this feedback, as you said. But they want to ask us, you have to pay for it like, like one, two thousand pounds. So it was no way. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, so I think Review Commons is free, but there is a, one of the big ones that's getting, or at least trying to get quite a lot of attention across uh, Twitter is one that you, you have to pay for. But it is tiered paying. So you, like if you're from a country where there's not a lot of funds for research, it, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. We're actually trying now to publish because they said at the end, no. So we are trying eLife, and I have to say eLife is great in this. They are so fast, so open, yeah. And hopefully they should give us at the end like a, uh, like a list what we should improve, mm. just based on that four reviewers will just discuss that before they will say, uh, send it to us, and then everything will be published together with, with the paper. So this, this, this is really great, right? And I'm glad you said that, because we've just teamed up with eLife to do some podcast stuff mm. in the coming months. Amazing. So we're probably going to be seeing a lot of nice things to them, but you said that and you're not paid by them, so that, that helps a lot. <laughs> um, so you've also mentioned sort of the, the workload aspect that, that PIs are under, so they've, they've got teaching to do, they've got an incredible amount of admin to do. Yeah. And one of the things you bring up, and it's something I also bring up a lot, and I'm interested to ask you this next question, actually. So you suggested that it would be really good to have sort of like a permanent postdoc position. And I think quite a lot of people think a permanent postdoc position would be great because there's a lot of people who never want to be a PI. They just love being in the lab. Personally, I hate being in the lab. So having suggested that, is that a career track, if it was available, would you take that career track? Uh, definitely for me, yeah. Oh, okay. I would love to do this because to be to be PI, it's so complex and you have much less time to actually do the cool science. Uh, so if this would be possible for me, you know, I would definitely take it. I, I agree as well. I just thought I'd jump in that I really like being in the lab and I like that side. I feel like being a PI is kind of almost a separate job. Mm. Like it's it doesn't feel like it follows on particularly well from what we do in the lab to there suddenly be like a manager 
I just yeah. I, I really like being in a lab and love what I do at the minute. <laughs> so I would I would also take that if uh, anyone's out there listening. <laughs> <laughs> Emma would like a job. <laughs> Emma would like a permanent postdoc job, please. <laughs> so the reason I framed it that way is just because quite a lot of the people I've spoken to who suggest this, and I'm very much one of these people, are people who would never actually do it. So it's, inter- it's, I, 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 it's interesting to hear people who would love to do that as a career because a lot of people I hear suggesting it are people who actually want to be PIs and are just maybe they're just suggesting it to get rid of the competition. I don't know. Um, but it is interesting because, like, like I said, personally, I hate the lab. I, that's not what I like doing. I think I'm the world's worst postdoc, honestly. I, I, I can't be good. Uh, uh, for, you know, for me, like a transition from postdoc to PI, it's like completely something different. Like you need so much more skills you couldn't train during your postdoc. And now you are you are on, you are in it on it on your own. You are lonely, you know, and you have to learn this. And if you fail in first two years, then <laughs> bye bye, you know. Yeah. So it's really tough. Yeah. And I, I liked your your sort of description you gave when you you put this idea across, which was that you'd have you know maybe fifty percent of this person's time would be what the the lab was doing, and then the other fifty percent you actually had as your your own time to do your own research. That I thought was was a really cool idea because then you get the be- almost the best of both worlds. I believe actually this system is working in some countries or in some institutes, but not not everywhere. I mean, it'd be great if to be like if this would be like normal, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, you could you could compete much much more with other labs. You can keep the know how you know of the methods, uh, and also you would be able to tell what's here because I found. We have so much antibodies, so much different things, uh, materials, drugs everywhere, and nobody knows about. It. And you keep yeah. buying new and new and new and new. So you know this problem, right? It could be much more cost-effective mm. than it's now. Yeah. I, I think so, I think some places in America do it where when they are made professors, they have it written into their contract that they have like a permanent postdoc or permanent research assistant. Mm. Where I used to work in Cambridge, they had a I think they had two positions actually in the end where they had postdocs whose job was to do like things like maternity cover. So they were permanent postdocs and they would just go around the labs and cover as people were off and as they were needed. Mm. And that seemed to work really well. And that, that, I think, is a shame we don't see a lot more of as well. Mm. But I think the main problem is also like uh, the, the funding, right? If it's mm. not stable position, it's only funded for a couple of years. And then if you're lucky, you get new funding and then new funding yeah. funding. But at some point, for example, in the lab, uh, which is next to us, uh, basically they had this nice postdoc guy, he was basically doing this like for a long time and he was there, uh, he was great, but then he was not unsure because of the pandemic, you know, if he will get the money to continue. So actually he got the option to apply for a different position and now he has his own lab, you know. So actually it's great for him. Yeah. That's the thing. If it would be like stable position alongside not funded by grants, you know, it'd be much better, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so last question I've got for you. Uh, you've already mentioned that you, you, ha- your, you know, how you met your PI. Um, but you, you, the story you gave us was that you met him because he was the only one who stayed up drinking with PhD students at a conference, which I, I mean, we're all for that. We think that's a great way to vet PIs. The ones who are willing to do that are usually the nice ones in the lab as well, actually. Um, so what has your experience of academia been just kind of overall? Have you had quite a a good experience or has there been anything that was rough and difficult oh, rough and difficult mm. you struggle during experiments that they aren't working you know and i think everybody experienced that right in the lab so i'm always trying to do like a 300 percentage more of fork than actually need to have like 50 percent of that you know so yeah otherwise than that i was very lucky that always my pi was was always like good great or at least i found some his characteristics you know which fit really well and i use it top of my uh, advantage well thank you so much that was really really interesting and i can't wait to see this published thank you that i could speak about it here it was really lovely to yeah to see you and to hear you and <laughs> i'm really glad that actually you 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 find me and send the email that i could actually talk about it it was a really interesting paper i mean we couldn't not yeah it was our pleasure having you on and i might be in contact uh in a bit for like you know maybe helping you or use that at some point hopefully <laughs> share the knowledge definitely. right <laughs> definitely I'm, I'm planning to now to send all the plasmids to a gene so, oh amazing yeah i was trying to to do it the way that everybody can follow it so i was trying to publish all the protocols i was using i was making on Figshare, mm. which is basically like a repository you know for these kind of things yeah. all the maps i put there now i'm trying to send things to, to a gene that people actually could, could could be using that, yeah. And one more thing I, I forgot to tell you, um, let me sell it. By using our uh, DEXCON system, you can actually target independently different alleles of the same gene. Oh, 
Cool. Because every gene, every allele can give you the expression level you need. Because if you do it without the external module, basically you will not see, it will be too too low. You will not see anything on microscope, you know, on microscopy. But if you if you use the external module, you can independently target different alleles, the same gene. And I did it for a plan B. So I actually was able to modify one allele with M neon green fluorescent and second one with M cherry. So but in theory you can do it like any any gene. So you can you can like Imagine like two more suppressors or mm. oncogenes. You can have one allele mut- mutated, like you know, like P53. Only one allele is enough to 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 make uh, unfunctional the, the whole you know P53 uh, tetramer. So you can tell in theory you can image inside one cell mutant and wild type you know gene, which is I think really cool. Mm. It just keeps. M is sold. M is. I'm right I'm in. already sold. My brain was just like, but in Alzheimer's, there's like different alleles for different mutations for the APO and APO4 and APO2 and 3 and stuff like that. We could have a look and see all together with those things. <laughs> My mind's racing. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it was lovely talking to you. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows.